Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Math 301, Introduction to Combinatorial Theory. And today we're talking about walks, the number of walks, and adjacency matrices. So let's say I have a hamster. Actually, to me, this doesn't look much like a hamster, but use your imagination. And you have a hamster habitat, which consists of little rooms and tunnels between those rooms. And the question is this. Let's say every minute your hamster moves from one room to an adjacent room. Then how many routes are there that the hamster can take if you specify the starting point, the ending point, and the number of minutes that the hamster travels? So the number of edges that the hamster travels. So you can think of this as a walk on this graph. So let's label the vertices of this graph, zero, one, two, and three. And this hamster is going to be walking randomly along the edges of this graph. And the question is, let's say we want to start at zero and end at two. How many ways could that be done let's say in 10 minutes. So this kind of problem, although the hamster drawing is kind of a joke, this type of problem shows up a lot in uh, percolate, percolation theory, where you have different states and you want you assign probabilities to move along from one edge to another, and you wanna figure out what happens over the long run. When people think about reintroducing wolves to the west, they do percolation theory. Or when you want to think about um, like the effects of fire on different animal and plant populations, you can do some percolation theory. So this kind of problem has a, a lot of uh, applications. I guess it also has a, a lot of applications to things like the stock market. So let's do the very simplest part of this problem first. Let's say we just had one minute and we wanna think about all the different routes that this hamster could take. So if the hamster starts at position zero, there's really not much it can do. It can pretty much only go to position one. But if it starts at position one, then it has three options for what it could do. It could go to positions uh, zero, two, or three. If it starts at position two, it could go to positions one or three. And if it starts at position three, it could go to positions one or two. So that's what could happen in one minute. And that information is encoded in the, in the adjacency matrix. So you remember how you find the adjacency matrix is you put a one, uh, so we're gonna label this, the columns with zero, one, two, and three, and the rows with zero, one, two, and three. And the adjacency matrix has a one in an entry if there's an edge between those corresponding vertices, and it has a zero otherwise. So vertex one is connected to vertices zero, two, and three, and so I put entries in the zero, two, and three columns of row one. And similarly, I put ones in the zero, two, and three columns of row of col rows of column one. Okay, and then two, we said two is also connected to three, and but two is not connected to zero, and three is not connected to zero. So this is the adjacency matrix. And remember that this is a symmetric matrix with ones on the diagonal. Okay, and so this, this adjacency matrix actually tells us what happens after one minute. So if you wanna figure out how many routes the hamster can take to go from vertex two to vertex zero in one minute, you look at the second row and the zero column and you look at that entry, there's a zero there. That means there's no way for that hamster to start at two and get to zero in one minute. Okay, so let's let's look at what happens in the second minute. So uh, if the hamster starts at zero, then 
then it and then goes to one, it could then go to zero, two, or three. If it starts at one and goes to zero, it could only go back to one. Uh, so we're just going to write out all the outcome possibilities here. So if it starts at two, sorry, starts at one, goes to two, then it could go to one and three. And if it starts at one, goes to three, then it could go to one and two. All right, and similarly, we can work out all the options and you can start to see that this, even for this very simple graph that has only four vertices, it's already kind of uh, complicated to figure out all the different things that this hamster can do in two minutes. All right, so, so let's see, three, one, and then zero, two, three, and then this is one, three. Okay, and so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make, make another matrix. This one here stood for one minute. We're now gonna make another matrix, M2, for what happens with the second minute. All right, so again, this is gonna be a four by four matrix. And the rows and the columns are gonna be labeled as zero, one, two, and three. Uh, we're going to take the row to be the starting point and the column to be the ending point, although it's it's not going to matter because you can go either way along these edges, and so this matrix will also be symmetric. Okay, so how many routes are there starting at zero and ending at zero? There's just one. It's this route here. So we're going to put a one here. How many routes start at zero and end at one? Well, none of them. And then we have one root that starts at zero and ends at two, and one root that starts at zero and ends at three. And you can also check that it's the same going backwards. So going from three to zero, there's uh, one way. Going from two to zero, there's one way. And going from uh, one to zero, there's no way. All right, how about going from one to one? Well, there, there, there are more possibilities because you can go um, to zero, you can go from one to zero and back to one, or you can go from one to three back to one, or you can go from one to two back to one. So there are actually three ways the hamster can travel from vertex one to vertex one in, in two minutes. And we see that that's because the degree of this vertex is three. And so that will speed things up a little bit because in fact, if you wanna have the same starting and ending point and you only have two minutes, you just have to go out and back. So we can fill in these diagonal entries Then there's gonna be a two here and there's gonna be a two here. So the, the diagonal entries are, are the degrees of the vertices. That's just for the matrix M2. All right, what if we wanted to go from one to two in two steps? Well, uh, the hamster never stops moving, so the only way we can do that is if you pass through vertex three. There's a one there and a one here. Vertex one to vertex three, there's similarly only one way of doing that. And finally, from vertex two to vertex three in two minutes, there's only one way of doing that. Okay, so this is the uh, matrix whose entries. So what we did here, remember the entries are the number of roots um, you know, I should say the IJ entry is the number, the IJ entry is the number of roots in two minutes 
from vertex I to vertex J. All right, so what's the problem here? The problem is that we really do not want to figure out, for instance, what M6 is, the number of routes the hamster can take in six minutes. And so we need an efficient way. So what's our, what's our goal here? Is the number of routes. So we, we fix I, the starting point. J, the ending point, N being the number of minutes. And our goal is to find the number of the routes the hamster can take uh, from vertex I to vertex J in exactly N minutes. The hamster is not allowed to stop and rest. Okay. All right, and what's the problem? In any real world application, you don't want n to be six, you want n to be 6,000. And so we, we need a system for figuring, figuring this out. And the way we're gonna do it is to make a matrix mn and it is a, um, it's an N by N matrix where N is the number of vertices. So in our particular example, little n is four. And the, in the ith row and the jth spot, the jth column, so if you piece together, so if you look at the ith row and the jth column, there's one entry there. And so the, the entry in the ij spot is this number of roots. All right, so it looks initially like we've just made our problem much worse because or just because all we've done is to re-express it by saying we want to keep track of all these numbers and we're going to put them in a matrix. So it doesn't seem like we've made it any easier except we now have this more complicated terminology of matrices. But it turns out the big theorem is that in fact this matrix is the nth power of the adjacency matrix. So uh, now that looks even worse because in order to understand this, you really have to have taken some linear algebra because to take a power of a matrix, you have to multiply that matrix by itself and here it's saying that we want to multiply this matrix by itself n times. And this, this just looks um, horrible, especially if you haven't taken linear algebra before. But let's just, um, turns out this is, once you know this theorem, we'll talk about why the theorem is true in a minute. But once you know this theorem, this is so fast to do. So for example, let's go back to this hamster graph that we had. And I'm gonna look in Sage and we're gonna make a matrix whose first row is 0, 1, 0, 1, second row is 1, 0, 1, 1, whose third row is 0, 1, 0, 1, and whose fourth row is 0, 1, 1, 0. So let's just see what that matrix looks like. It looks like this. And this is the adjacency matrix that we had before. And now let's look at M2. To find M2, we take M1 and square it. So I would never want to spend class time or lecture time squaring a four by four matrix. That would be very time consuming. And especially if you don't remember linear algebra, it would be completely incomprehensible. But the good thing is that the computer can do that so quickly. And notice 
notice that it's exactly the matrix that we found before. For instance, this matrix that told us there were three ways to start at vertex one and get back to vertex one in two minutes, and that there was one way to start at vertex one and end at vertex three in two minutes. So this matrix, the square of the previous one, is the one that we, we had before. Now in the quiz, you might have to figure out what happens in six minutes. And so in six minutes, how would you do that? You would take the adjacency matrix M1, you raise it to the sixth power, okay? All right, so the coefficients are getting bigger here. And let's think about what this is telling us. It's telling us, for example, that there are um, in, in row zero and column three is 17. That's the entry. Is 17. And so what that tells us is that there are 17 routes the hamster can take from vertex zero to vertex three in six minutes. Great. And similarly, let's look at this number 31 here. So, so the entry in row, what's row is that? That's row three and column two, oh no, that's column one, is 31. And so there are 31 routes the hamster can take from vertex three to vertex one in six minutes. So you can see how quickly this Sage computer program can take do matrix multiplication. And then using this theorem, we can figure out how many routes the hamster can do from vertex one to vertex you know, two in a certain number of minutes. And, and notice you would never wanna actually write down these routes because this is getting to be just way, way too many routes to write down. Okay, so let's go back and think a little bit about why this theorem is true. Before I tell you why it's true, let me tell you that that in fact one of the reasons uh, this if you've taken linear algebra, you might have heard of eigenvalues. You might have heard of diagonalizing a matrix. And one reason that this is so incredibly fast to do so that you could not even just find the six powers of the matrices, but the six thousandth power of a matrix is that you can diagonalize the matrix, take the huge power of that, which just means taking the that power of the eigenvalues and then sort of undiagonalize it. And so that's why this theorem is incredibly efficient to, to program. Okay, but now we, now we have to understand why, why is it true? And so to understand why it's true, let's think a little bit more about, um, let's think a little bit more about um, a, a route of length n going from i to j. Okay, and that route, so it starts at i, it does a bunch of stuff, then it has a last, second to last step, penultimate vertex, and then it lands at j. And so, Let's think about, about, there are lots of different ways that you could get from I to a vertex V. And this would be a route of a slightly smaller length. From I to V, V and and V here could be any vertex in the graph. And then you have to make one last step. You need an edge from V to J. Okay. 
So a route of length n minus one from i to v, this is the i v entry, meaning the entry in the ith row and the vth column of the earlier matrix, the matrix m n minus one, because by definition, this IV entry of this earlier matrix M n minus one is the number of routes from I to V in n minus one minutes. And this edge from V to J, well, it might be there in the graph or it might not. And so this is, this is the entry in the the VJ entry in the matrix M1. And so what, what, we, need to, what we need to do is, uh, and that, so if there's an edge from V to J, that entry will be one. And if there's not an edge from V to J, that entry will be zero. And so what we need to do is to um, as V ranges um, among the vertices, let's call them sort of V1 through Vn, then we need to find, find, um, find, the, find the entry of the matrix M n minus one in the I V spot. And we multiply it by uh, zero if V and J are adjacent or not adjacent. And we multiply it by one if V and J are adjacent. But in both cases, that is the V J entry of the matrix M1. And then we have to take the sum of those as V goes from V1 to Vn. Maybe um, this is a little bit awkward because we called their vertices zero through three before and now we're calling them V1 through Vn. But the idea is that we're adding up and things. And the way of thinking about that, let's let's do an example. Let's say, let's say I is um, let's say I is one and J is one and N is three. And we want to find, so we're going to let V range from among the vertices, which we called 0, 1, 2, and 3. We're going to find the number of routes of length 2 from 1 to 1, uh, from 1 to V. Then we're going to see is V adjacent to one. And then we're going to work it all out. Okay, so this row is the easiest. Is V adjacent to one? Yes, if V is zero, two, or three. And no, if V is one, because the vertex one is not adjacent to itself. And what are the number of roots of length two from one to V? So from one to zero, you cannot get there in two steps. You either overshoot or you won't get there. So there are no roots from length two from one to zero. How many roots of length two are there from one to one, well, we already figured that out. There were three roots where you start at one and go out and back. The number of roots of length two from one to V, when V is two, is one. And the number of roots of length two from one to three 
is one. Okay, and so then, so it is not possible to take a root of length two from one to zero and then come back to one. So what that tells us is that if you want to start at one and end at one and have a root of length three, you you can do that, but you can't do that, but you, you will never travel to vertex zero along the way. Uh, similarly, if you want to um, do a route of length three, starting at one and ending at one, then you, you're not going to hit the vertex one after doing two steps. So what we're doing here is we're finding the number of roots that go through V in the penultimate step. Okay, but it is possible to do a root of length three, starting at one, ending at one, where you hit two in the second step. That's the root that goes one, three, two, one. And it is possible to do a root from vertex one to vertex one that has three as its last second, to, its penultimate step, because you can go around this way. Okay, and so all together, all this work we did was to just figure out that there are two roots, two roots from um, one, vertex one to vertex one that take three minutes. Okay, well that, you could have maybe guessed that just by looking at the graph and kind of checking out the routes, but there's a, a reason for doing it this way, which is that it explains the main idea of the proof. So if you take a look at this, 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 this series of entries, 0, 3, 1, 1, that happens to be the, the row 1 of the matrix M2. Let me just convince you of that. I think I can go backwards here. Yeah, so you see this zero, three, one, one. That was the row for vertex one in the matrix M2. And that makes sense because what it's telling us is that in two minutes, starting at vertex one, these were the numbers of ways that we could end up at the vertices zero, one, two, and three. Similarly, the, the next thing, the, the row after that is zero, one, zero, one. And notice that that is, um, sorry, let me go back. This one, one, zero, one, one, that happens to be column one. This is column one of M1. Let's just see why that, see that on this picture here. So the column one is, is this one. And if you've taken anything about uh, matrix multiplication, one thing that you can, uh, you might remember, is how to take products of matrices. So remember that we're trying to find the third power of the adjacency matrix. And one way of finding the third power is that it's the product of the second power and the first power. And so let's say we wanted to find M the third power, M1 cubed. Well, it's M1 squared 
times m1. And if you want to find an entry of that, to find the ij entry of m1 cubed, what you do is you take the ith row of m1 squared and you take the jth column of m1 and you take their dot product. Dot product just means take the product of the first entries, add them to the product of the second entries, add them to the product of the third entries, add them to the product of the fourth entries, and so on. And this is something that's true about matrix multiplication in general. If you want to take find the nth power of a matrix, you would take the n minus first power of that matrix and then multiply it by m1. And so to do that, you would take the ith row of the n minus first power of the matrix and the jth column of the matrix, and you take their dot product. And so let's go back to this slide here to think about what that means. The dot product, the dot product of this row and this column, the way you do it is you take the first entries and you take their product. Well, zero times one is zero. Take these entries, you take their product. Three times zero is zero. Take these entries, take their product, you get one. Take these entries, you get their product, it's one. So this row is the dot product of these two um, previous, previous rows. And then if you add them up, the sum is two. All right, so we may have gotten a little lost in this calculation, but the main idea of what's going on in this proof is to, is to think about the routes of length n and separate them into a route of length n minus one and a final route of length one, final edge of length one. And that route of length n minus one, it has some ending point and it could be any ending point. And so we have to think about the number of ways that you can get from i to v in n minus one steps, and then see if you can get from v to j in one step, one edge, and then we take the products of those entries and add them up. And so that's exactly the dot product of the i row of the previous matrix and the jth column of M1. And that exactly gives you the ij entry in, in the matrix, the nth power of the matrix. This here, you can see that this is the, this is the dot product. So, so in conclusion, I think this is kind of cool because matrix multiplication, which is maybe the most boring thing that you might have to learn in linear algebra, here has this big application in terms of finding the number of routes in a graph from one vertex to another. And, um, and so that, and really the idea behind matrix multiplication is the same as this idea of sort of dividing things up into um, routes that have one smaller length but end somewhere else and then getting back to the finishing point. Okay, so that's all for today and next time we'll go on to chapter nine.